Today, we're going to be speaking to an artist who has given a new meaning to the phrase, a change of heart, and how he used this radical change to take his music to an unexpected place. This is Lifestyle Magazine with your host, Roy Ice, and key experts, Mike Tucker, Dr. Sharmini Long, Lionel LaMountain, and Marie Mitchell. Despite being born with a potentially life-threatening heart defect, our guest today, Paul Cardall, has become a world-recognized pianist. Welcome, Paul. We're delighted to have you here. Now, I'm going to talk about your heart a little bit later on, but I want to start out talking about your career. You are known as a pianist, but where did that all come from? How did that start? Well, it was after my third open heart surgery. I was really trying to understand what on earth I'm here for when my parents had fought to keep me alive, doctors fought to keep me alive. And I went into my parents' living room where there's an upright piano. Yeah. And I looked at that piano like it was like a mystery. I, I'd taken lessons when I was eight years old. Yeah. Like most kids, and my mother had eight kids. Wow. So I wasn't forced to continue. In about six months, I, uh, I quit. But I had lost a friend in high school, and he played the piano. So I was like, why am I here if I have all these heart problems? And how, why would somebody just out of nowhere who's perfectly healthy go? Yeah. And I sat at the piano and, you know, growing up in hospitals, I would always hear the beep, beep, beep. But I sat there and I just hit like three notes. And there was this tone like to this little melody that just was like the complete opposite. And I felt this overwhelming like peace. Yeah. Like everything's going to be okay. And I started working on that piano like it was a puzzle and it was life. And I wanted to figure out the mysteries. And there were patterns and melodies. Yeah. So my heart began to heal hmm. spiritually. How old were you at that time? I was 16 years old. Yeah. 16 years old. But I was playing three hours a day. It became my, my Xbox. And yeah. it's been my life's work ever since to use music to heal other hearts. Yeah. So uh, did you self-train or did you then start taking <laughs> lessons? How did that go? Well, I surrounded myself with the very best musicians and I would play and kind of be self-taught and, hmm. you know, I, I gathered with a friend to write a concerto for high school uh, classical nights. So we had like on the program, it was Mozart, Beethoven, and then Cardall, which was really awkward because <laughs> my piece sounded like a bad Nintendo song. <laughs> but that was the beginning of like just surrounding yourself with people that are much better at what you do yeah and just kind of pick up on what they're doing and and yeah. the rest was you know kind of just to get into the groove of understanding the music business yeah what's involved there because you don't just you don't you don't just build a career no as a pianist and yeah. be able to provide for your family yeah absolutely now your music is not just stuff that you you play it or you write it because you like the sound of it your your music has deeper messages, meanings, and inspiration. Talk to me about how you write. I sit and I just start improvising what I'm feeling. Mm -hmm. And I go off the fact that it's clinically proven that if you listen to certain types of music, the very calm, soothing piano, kind of classical, but instrumental, you're less likely to have stress or anxiety. Yeah. Doesn't mean I don't have that. Yeah. But the listener, as you're listening to music, the dopamine, Mm -hmm. is released and you, the, the, you know, I have all these studies on, on my website that Harvard has done that mm -hmm. clinically show if you listen to the, the instrumental, mm -hmm. it will boost your immune system. And so that's kind of what I, I do, but it really, it's the messages of recognizing how beautiful this world is because I've, I've fought my entire life to be here. Yeah. My parents have spent a fortune on medical bills. Surgeons have had to, dig deep into textbooks and come up with bigger ideas yeah. so that not just me, but millions of kids born with the number one infant related cause of death, congenital heart disease can survive. Now your music does help a lot of people who are dealing with anxiety, depression, all those things. Um, in your process of writing, is it therapeutic for you as well? Oh yeah. 
In which ways? Well, for example, this last album that I worked on, I didn't want to have a perfect Steinway. <laughs> you know, I'm a Steinway artist. I'm supposed to work on a Steinway. <laughs> I wanted a beat up old upright piano that was broken, out of tune, because that's kind of how we are. Hmm. We're broken, we're out of tune, yeah. but we need somebody to tune us up and make us like look, feel, and heal. Yeah. And uh, so I, I sat in with this beat up old piano. I lit the candles, it was dark. The engineers, you know, clear in the other room, I'm by <laughs> myself. And I just start improvising. It's kind of like a jazz artist, but yeah. I'm more of a minimalist classical right. style. It's very um, soothing and calming. You don't have to think too much. Okay. And so I just start playing the emotion and there's so many elements of sadness and yet amidst all that is hope and joy and it just kind of flows out and then I go and select <laughs> what's the best stuff yeah. and we narrow it down and that's what ends up going on albums. Uh, that's amazing. What's your favorite song from that album? Oh, September Wins. Why? Because September is such a, a time where we, you know, we're all back in school. We're kind of back into the, going into the fourth quarter. It's kind of right before the storm hits with the holidays and the stress of the holidays. Yep. And we just have all these memories we created in the summertime. Mm -hmm. And I think the fall is very beautiful, but the tone quality of this particular piece has a very nostalgic feel. Mm -hmm. But in that nostalgia, we learn from the past mm. and there's so much that we can gain from it in order to try <laughs> to not repeat yeah. a lot of the past, only the good stuff you want to repeat. So yeah. September Winds kind of blows in as the first song on that album, December. Uh, that's great. Now, I want to talk to you more ab about your music career, but I also want us to, to dig a little bit deeper because, I mean, a lot of your inspiration is coming from the obstacles that you've had to overcome. Yeah. We have to take a break right now, but next on Lifestyle, we're going to learn what Paul had to overcome after being born with half a heart. Joining the conversation will be our wellness key specialist, Dr. Sharmini Long. We're back talking to Paul Cardall, and we've just been listening to your track, September Winds. Beautiful. Thank you so, so much. Beautiful. Thank yeah. you. You really were born with a heart defect that was severe, where your right side of your heart was not functioning at all. Talk to us a little bit about your childhood and what that was like growing up and how you even survived the first days of your life. Yeah. Heart surgery was still relatively new, and operating on children was just unfathomable. Rare. So when I came to this world, I only had a single functioning ventricle. And immediately out of the womb, they knew there was a problem. And my mother had lost her baby sister oh, to heart wow. disease a long time ago. And so she was Very scared. sensitive, yeah. And fortunately, there was a surgeon in California that they brought in to Salt Lake City where I had surgery less than a day old. Wow. And. You ask about my childhood. My parents were people of faith. They believed in miracles. So I was very fortunate to have parents who said, you know, you were made for a purpose. You, uh, you know, as long as you're doing what's right, you'll, you'll be alive, which is the- <laughs> Is that stressful? Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, it's the added pressure, but I love them because they were so passionate about my sure. care and so many kids don't have that. Yeah. You know, I had, there were other siblings, there were eight, eight of us. Yeah. So my mother already had her hands full, but so it wasn't a time with the internet where you could look up your symptoms and worry sure. about your kids obsessively or start a podcast and start telling everybody yeah. about their problems. It pretty much was, <laughs> was, we think you're the only person with this issue and you're pretty extraordinary. So yeah. in a way I felt like, you know, the, the special kid. And I'd, mm. I'd be like, yeah, I'm the team manager of the soccer team, but so was Clark Kent, <laughs> you know? And then when everybody left, he kicked that football and, it, you know, so yeah. it, you kind of feel like a an awkward little superhero with a power that uh, you have that you know about that others don't, don't have. have. 
Yeah. And you talked about kind of day to day they were taking care of you. It wasn't like you had surgery at 22 hours old and then everything was fine. No, I was always in the hospital, x-rays, you know, I call it the era of nurses and needles. Yeah. I saw nurses all the time, just test after test. And I was fearful, I was afraid. Um, fortunately, you know, I go back to my mother because she did not hover over me like this was, you know, I'm gonna get sick. Her faith was in trusting uh, uh, that there's something out there guiding this whole process. What you're supposed to do. Yeah, so she saw that in the future and that gave her comfort and that was instilled in me so I never thought about, you know, I'm not gonna be around. Sure. Mm -hmm. I wasn't thinking about retirement. I was thinking about what's what happens after we die. Yeah. So as a child, I became obsessed with trying to understand, you know, religion, spirituality, mm -hmm. which kids, they should be outside playing yeah. football and getting dirty and I did all that, but I couldn't keep up with other kids. Yeah. Usually when you're a kid, you kind of think you're invincible. Totally. And life is gonna go on forever. Totally. But you had the opposite perspective. Plus I had bluish lips. Mm. Yeah. So kids would, uh, the girls would call me purple plum, <laughs> but the girls were talking to me, so I was fine. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, but boys, they'd call me raisin, yeah. things like that. I was teased, but you know, I felt different from everybody. Now at age 13, you had a really significant scare. What endocarditis. Endocarditis is a, you know, you know, a horrible staph infection. It was on that damaged heart mm -hmm. and I was in the hospital, I nearly died. So people with a regular heart who have endocarditis can die very easily. Very and easily. You had a still significantly impaired heart. Well, they couldn't even find the source of it because they were using antibiotics to try to kill it. But they fortunately had an MRI that was pretty new in 1986. And I went into the MRI and they found that it was in the heart. Wow. So the surgeon was worried because he had to take that down yeah. and put something back up to keep blood flowing. Yeah. So they said to me, you're going to have this heart surgery. And then a year later, if you survive, you know, we need you to come back and have completely reconstructive heart surgery. Wow. So that was the struggle of being a kid with that. And... Um, Wow, so growing up, how many surgeries did you ultimately have to have? So I had three major open heart surgeries before I went into heart failure as a 32 year old man. And uh, I had countless procedures, angiograms, you know, anyone who looks at my, my neck or, you know, will see scarring. Mm. And that's just, that was my life. I didn't know anything else. Yeah. Wow. So I just saw it as, this is my cross to bear. So how did you manage living with what I can only imagine is this constant angst of death hanging over your head? Well, again, like you said, kids feel immortal, mm -hmm. but I felt like I, God had my back. Yeah. Mm. I felt a closeness because I was always seeking a higher power because if I just focused on what is now, yeah. then it, it could be miserable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And regardless of what you believe, we, step three of any 12-step program says you've got to let go and let God. Yeah. And the superpower that I had inside of me basically confirmed mm -hmm. that um, everything is going to work out. So well, you had a sense of peace, really. From a sense of peace. Fear. Mm -hmm. But peace. But fear can be a liar. Yeah. That's right. And so, but you have a sense of peace, like, you're made for a purpose. And I do believe that everybody has this unique, incredible story. Yeah. And then when you add that extra layer of recognizing there is a higher power guiding you, then life becomes livable yeah. and enjoyable. Yeah, I wanna talk more about this, but we gotta take a break. And when we come back, we're gonna talk with Paul about how he's used music as a therapeutic tool and the way he has spread that healing to other people. So don't go away. Life can be difficult, and we never know what's going to be thrown at us. So how can we find comfort and healing in tough times? It's no coincidence that we find ourselves listening to music on our morning commute or alone at home. Music is one of the most therapeutic tools when it comes to mental health. Music can be healing. 
So when you find yourself overwhelmed, open up your favorite playlist and take a moment to find some peace. And we're back with Paul Cardell. Now, Paul, I understand that even in the midst of all these surgeries and everything, that that's when you found music to be healing. How did that take place? Well, anybody that sits and plays an instrument, it's clinically proven. Yeah. There are studies that allow you to process trauma mm -hmm. yeah. and emotions as you're playing the piano. So when I was in the hospital waiting some 385 days because I was in heart failure and needed a heart transplant, you know, God says, change your heart. So I, I took that, <laughs> you know, so, so I'm in the hospital and I'm not sure if I'm going to live or I'm going to die. Wow. And fortunately they said, there's a piano in mm -hmm. the building. Yeah. And so my nurses would gather all my oxygen, my Milrinone packets and, and all the IVs. And they would take me like this entourage <laughs> down the hall into this area where there was a piano and I would sit at the piano around nine o'clock at night because people had left. Yeah. And I would just process mm. everything I was going through, the horrific thought of me not being around because my daughter, I was trying to be alive for my daughter. Uh, and, and so I'd sit and I'd play and I wrote, you know, Gracie's theme, which has become a very popular resource for families. Hmm. affected wow. by congenital heart disease or chronic illness. And then slowly people would gather one at a time. And even though I had already established a career and it was nice because I could do little concerts hmm. and not have to think business. Yeah. <laughs> right. I could just play and the music began helping to heal and soothe other families. And when they start asking, hey, can you play this and play that? you know the effect that music has. Absolutely. Now, he mentioned that there's some studies. Do you know of any studies about the effects of sure. music helping people heal? Yeah, there actually are quite a few studies and um, Harvard has done a lot of them. Mm. But even as far as, you know, music decreasing blood pressure, decreasing pain in, you know, post-operative settings, mm. decreasing the need for pain medication, decreasing anxiety, it really has a significant impact in a lot of areas and especially with the heart. Yeah. Yeah, it's been clinically proven. And, you know, that's why, again, the type of music I've been creating all these years, my website actually lists yeah. all those studies. You can read the benefits of how it boosts the immune system. And uh, if there's ever a time when we need <laughs> to feel peace, peace is available. Yeah. You can access it through music, not just my music, but find something you love to listen to lay on the couch for two minutes, take two minutes, you can take two minutes, and just listen and you will regroup yeah. and you will feel much better. Yeah. And it's been my life's work because my heart's been healed, mm. I'm still working on my mental heart, mm. but to use music as a tool to heal other hearts. How has knowing that as you do impacted the style of music and the way that you put music out? I, I listen very closely to the tones because yeah. tones affect the way we do things. In yeah. fact, I, you know, I got a message from a young man in Iraq a long time ago. His family was killed in the first Gulf War oh, wow. and he was working on a U.S. military base on the enemy base. And he was struggling in this note. He said that he was contemplating suicide. Oh no. But he heard this song that I had done called Redeemer. And it was clear over there in the Middle East. Wow. And in that moment, he said, he heard Allah say, you should live. Wow. And so that's the type of effect music has in order to empower us to go, this, you know what, this life is beautiful. Mm. It is worth living. What does it feel like as an artist to hear stories like that of how you've impacted someone completely on the other side of the world? It's, look, God knows who is hurting yeah. and what they need. And he will keep putting it in front of them yeah. and eventually someone will hear it. You know, I think he's trying to reach us. Does it feel like it's come full circle and yeah. there is your sense of purpose in what you're here for? Yeah, yeah, like why am I here? Yeah. But you know, I, I prefer to go, that's what I do. But being a husband and a father to two girls is the reward. Yeah. That's the joy. Yeah. This is 
this is a calling, but family should always come before the, the calling, which sure. that's, the, that's, that's the challenge. Yeah. How does your family feel about your music career? Any, any of your daughters following your footsteps? Or? <laughs> well, my youngest uh, is into plants. Yeah. So she tells me, her, I go, how the plants? She goes, well, they're living their best life. <laughs> um, and then my other daughter, she's very musical mm -hmm. and plays, in, but she's very private about it. She, yeah. she doesn't want to be known. And I, I love that because she's doing it yeah. for herself. And she writes, and it's incredible, yeah. incredible yeah. to watch. She has a great example from her father who says, you know, art, music, it is all about evoking emotion that's yeah. about you know uh, a higher purpose than just making music that people will want to buy albums you're, you're actively trying to help people live their best life possible through your music so that's, that's so amazing what's the best way for people to connect with your music on your website uh, what's your website address well, it's paulcardall.com uh, you can google my name but I've got Alexa and Siri working for me, so you can always ask them <laughs> right. to play September Wins. That's right. If they can finally understand yeah. what we're saying. It's, freaking... <laughs> it's been a delight having you. We're so what? glad you're, you're here. You've touched our hearts today, and we've got, to, uh, we've got to take a break now, but uh, stay tuned, because when we come back, I have some final thoughts. Why are you still living? According to our key number five, existence, is because you still have something valuable to give. If you are still alive, you still have a purpose. So take a look at all the things that you are capable of doing that can bring joy and healing to your world and live your best existence possible today. For more meaningful life tips and an opportunity to view this show and all other episodes, visit our website at lifestyle.org. Thanks for watching, and we look forward to continuing this journey with you on future episodes of Lifestyle Magazine.